cross-sections of the pews. Uh, several announcements for you related to our observance of Lent. Uh, we will continue to receive the um, One Great Hour Sharing Offering that is so helpful in times of natural disaster. We will receive that through Easter. Um, the Holy Week schedule is in uh, an, on an insert in your bulletin. We encourage you to pass along a copy to someone who has no church home. Um, on Thursday evening, uh, we will explore uh, the Last Supper, the institution uh, of Holy Communion. And on Friday, of course, we will remember Jesus' death upon the cross. Holy Week services are all different and all very experiential. And so uh, we'll, we encourage you to um, attend all of the services. Monday, Thursday worship begins at 7 p.m. Good Friday worship begins at 8 p.m. Please note a new member class will begin on April 23rd. If you're interested, please let Don or me know. The World Vision Day is an opportunity for um, families as well as individuals uh, to do some good work, and that will be April 22nd, 9 a.m. to noon. The information is in your bulletin on page 6, and Lauren has an additional announcement. I just wanted to take a minute to invite you all um, for April 30th. There's going to be a family game day from 3 o'clock until 5 o'clock downstairs, um, the dining room and the assembly area. So we're going to have all kinds of games. It'll be really fun and some snacks as well. So I hope you'll all take some time and join us and have fun together as a church family. And as we do the call to worship today, let's all wave our palm branches. This is a great day that the Lord has made. Jesus is coming. He comes to us riding on a donkey. Open wide the gates. Let us welcome him with branches.
O Lord Jesus Christ, on this day you receive the worship of those who hailed you as their king. Accept our praise and adoration, our worship and love, and grant that we who now confess you with our lips may never fail to give you the service of our lives for the honor of your holy name, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Let us confess our sins together. God of compassion, we confess that we prefer darkness to your light and our ways to your ways. We do what is easy rather than what is right, and we have been dishonest with ourselves and each other. Forgive our fleeting enthusiasms and our shallow commitments. God of grace, give us the grace to receive forgiveness and to extend it to others and a strong desire to live in peace. Amen. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace and peace of the Lord be with you.
Let us join together in prayer. Lord, on this day we come to you with open hearts and open hands, ready to hear what you have to say to us, ready to receive the blessings that you give us, ready to worship and praise you for the grace and forgiveness that you give to us. Open our eyes to hear your word and to hear your truth through the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of the readings that have been traditionally read during the Palm Sunday uh, times, the first is from uh, the Psalms, verses uh, Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O God. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Before I ask the children up, I'm going to ask the adults to help us out with your palms. We'll wave the children on in here. And children, if you have palms, bring them up with you. Come and sit on the carpet and right by me. You give him a wave. Good morning. Good morning. Today is Palm Sunday, which is one of the fun Sundays, I think, because you get these really fun palms and you can wave them around. These are palm branches. Do you know why we have palm branches on Palm Sunday? Do you know, yeah, Riley? Exactly. So this is the Sunday that we, we remember that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, which is a baby donkey. And he comes into town, and the people started calling Jesus the king of the Jews because they saw him as a king. He is our king. And they started saying, Hosanna, which means save us, because they knew he was a king that came to save us. And they also said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord because he's God's son. So they were talking about all of these exciting things. This, the king, God's son, who's coming to save us, is coming to Jerusalem. So they grabbed palm branches, because that's what they had, and people started putting their cloaks on the ground so that the donkey could pass over them. It's like the red carpet treatment for Jesus back then. So they had a big parade and a party for Jesus, basically coming into, into Jerusalem, and it was really exciting. Yes? That was, a, that was actually a different time, but you're right, he did. Yes, Sophia? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's pray about Jesus, the king, coming into town, okay? Jesus, you are so wonderful in so many ways, and that the people recognized you as the king and of God's son was just amazing. And I pray that you will help us to recognize that today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, before we get up, I want you guys to pick a phrase. 
either Hosanna or um, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord or here comes the king of the Jews. And I want you to say it really loud as you wave your palms in the air and then we'll wave our palms as we head on out. Okay, so pick one. Ready? On the count of three, we'll just yell it out because we're happy, right? And then we'll wave our palms the whole way out. Ready? One, two, three. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Good job. All right, let's go. In our gospel reading this morning, we'll hear some of the psalm that we read repeated as indeed we hear the story again of Jesus' entrance into the city. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Indeed, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, you know our hearts. You know the truth that we need to hear. You know the grace that we need to receive, the blessing that you have for us. Open us to receive all that you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you'll recall, the headlines during the recent election campaign read something like this. Democrats and Republicans both predict disaster if the other wins. <laughs> now, why did I start out mentioning that? Well, I kind of want to heighten your anxiety. <laughs> How'd I do? As soon as I start talking about that, I'm sure the anxiety comes up a little in the room for you're wondering if I'm going to launch off on some political um, sermon on this Palm Sunday because, after all, Jesus' entrance into the city that day had tremendous political overtones. Deep breath. I'm not going to go into politics. <laughs> but what I'd like to reflect on is something that I've known I've been aware of and I know that everybody around me has been aware of as they've mentioned it in their conversation, is that there is a lot of fear out there in the world. A lot of fear, of course, about politics, but a lot of fear of other things that are constantly stirred up in us. Maybe we're paying a little bit more attention to our fears because of the election. You can hear it in people's conversations. 
Sometimes I can see it in their eyes. What I really hope to shed some light on, really I hope the Spirit sheds some light on, is this sudden proliferation of fear in our world. We're more aware today that advertisers, politicians, economists, environmentalists, human rights advocates, school, school bullies, seem to be more intentional about using fear in order to get their point across or in order to get you to buy a product. It's not that just the election cycle that causes us to wonder if the sky is falling in. Now for me, what I'm especially disheartened about is when I find and hear about political and religious leaders using fear to promote, their, uh, promote a decision or to forward one of their causes. Now it just seems to me, and, and it's an experience I've had, that, that we are bombarded by messages that would cause us to fear. Every corner. Fear of unemployment, fear of a crashing economy, fear of the theology of terrorists, the fear of uh, the new kid in the block, fear of failing, fear of all those things. I mean, open your bulletin and take a look at the cover of the bulletin. There are all the fears that come at us from every side and every direction. Now, more likely, if I went around the sanctuary this morning, you could even add some of your own. As people who seek the peace of God that passes all understanding, as ones who welcome the Prince of Peace, how are we to live in the midst of these fears that are expressed so often and so frequently and sometimes so violently? Now, our lives are certainly different from the lives of those who welcomed Jesus that day into the city of Jerusalem, but they, their lives also were riddled with fears. And the scripture even talks about some of those fears, the Roman occupation, the the tax collector, the conquering hordes that bordered the nation, their own illness, their own death. Actually, the truth is, when we take a look at it, fear has been part of the human experience from the very beginning. You remember Adam and Eve? And God walk, was walking in the, in the garden. He was looking for them, but they were hiding. And why were they hiding? They were afraid. Fear has been part of our lives. I think that's why God, throughout the history of God's people, his interactions with the people of Israel, so oftentimes turns to calming those fears, removing those fears, abolishing those fears. To Abraham and Jacob, to Joseph and Moses, to the great patriarchs, when they faced situations that had them shaking in their boots, God would always send a message, don't be afraid, don't be afraid for I am with you. To Mary and Joseph, the disciples, and to us, the promise remains the same. I believe there's great hope for peace and great hope for peace in our land. And that's what Jesus' message was that day he rode into Jerusalem. Finally, those people thought, and we can think, a savior who is going to relieve fear, anguish, and oppression. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. As the nation of Israel takes shape through biblical history, we notice that their days were made up with threats of invasion and threats of conquest from uh, neighboring nations. The nations surrounding the people of God always pressed in upon them, and prophets like Isaiah were always called to calm their fears, to direct the holy, pe uh, holy people in their journey, and to proclaim God's wor word. Isaiah, in one point in time, talks about the victor who is arising in the east. For Isaiah himself knows that there's trouble on the horizon. That victor from the east, scholars believe, was Cyrus of Persia. Now, Cyrus was the ruler of Persia. He ruled during the 5th century BCE. He's been called the father of the Iranian nation. His conquest of neighboring nations was motivated primarily because Israel blocked his nation from the sea, the source of trade. That tiny nation lay in Cyrus's path. And you can imagine how the awareness of Cyrus on the east was 
not very comforting to people. However, with Cyrus looming on the horizon, Isaiah turns and says to, to God's people that God delivers up nations, he tramples kings underfoot, he makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow, he pursues them and passes, passes on safely, scarcely touching the path with his feet. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am first, and I will be last. Isaiah reminds them of the power of God, that the power of God supersedes any other superpower that may be around them. He, the power of God eliminates fear and restores trust in him. The power of creator uh, exceeds any earthly ruler and Isaiah is there to remind the people take a deep breath no fear of conquest because I the Lord am with you see God's always had a special love for his people not only is God totally unlike the powerful rulers of the lands because God's power is beyond them but God cares for his people Isaiah reminds them that because God has a history with these people that they can trust him. Isaiah says, you are my servant, says God. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious hand. Faced with geopolitical forces, that threaten change and interpersonal forces that they faced every day, God says, do not fear. I am with you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'll uphold you. But of course, the question comes, did the Israelites believe the prophet and God? I think that's the question <coughs> Jesus asked also. Although in different forms, I think that's the lesson he taught most, to trust in God, that God's promises are solid. When he entered Jerusalem that day, I can't help but thinking that he, he finally felt, if you would, some, some sense of success, because he entered, he entered Jerusalem and they were waving palms and shouting his name and making the, a, a path like the red carpet for him. I wonder if he sat there and said, they finally got it. They finally are going to trust God. Here we go. <laughs> but then, at the end of the week, <laughs> I wonder if he thought to himself, how have I failed so miserably? They're all running away from me. Even my friends are leaving me. So much so that Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no doubt that we live in tumultuous times. As with Israel, we are affected by geopolitical forces, and there are other fears. Fears that we wake to every night, and fears that we go to sleep to. Uh, fears that we wake to every morning, and fears that put us to sleep every night. Sometimes I suspect we find ourselves facing the fears because of personal pain we've experienced, loss of a loved one, a terminal diagnosis, family disintegration, the financial ups and downs, as well as the geopolitical forces, when it seems like all the bolts have been taken off and everything is loose. I think in these times, it's hard for us to trust God. It's hard for us to hear those words, do not fear, I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. But those are the words that he wants us to hear and believe. I wonder, I've often wondered what it would be like if everyone believed those words, if everyone trusted in God. What would it look like? What would the nations feel like? What would it be that with the assurance that we are surrounded by God's presence, supported by his hand, and that we do not have to fear, for indeed God's power is in us, that we would be strengthened and sustained? I wonder what that would be like. Martin Rinkert was born in what's now Germany. 
Most of his professional life he spent uh, as a priest during the Thirty Years' War. Not being <coughs> a historical scholar, I was sent back to Wikipedia to find out that the Thirty Years' War was between 1618 and 1684. It was a devastating war. The town in which he was serving, Islandsburg, was a walled town and it had become a refuge to a lot of fugitives who were fleeing the conflict around them. It was seriously overcrowded as a result. The resources were few. Hunger and starvation was ex were experienced by most. In these conditions, obviously, epidemics started to sweep through the town. And the first to die were his wife, along with some of the clergy, rest of the clergy in town. Rinkert was left to preside over funerals some 40 to 50 a day. The whole epidemic, 8,000 people died. But not only was he overseeing the the services of those who had died, but he also found himself in a very unenviable posi position where he had to negotiate and be a go-between between the marauding armies who came and wanted to set up camp in their town and, and the townsfolks. When the invading armies came in and took up residence there, they took the people's food, they took their homes, they even took their money. So it's not a surprise that some historians, after peace was finally established, described Rinkert as a worn out and prematurely aged man. But Rinkert, in spite of all the suffering he witnessed and endured, managed to continue his trust in God. He wrote a hymn in the midst of the Thirty Year War to express this. He said, the hymn verse you might recognize, O oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, and keep us still in grace, and guide us when perplexed, and free us from all ills in this, word and in this world and the next. Trusting God, trusting God in the middle of something we will never experience. Trusting God when everything around the corner seems to be threatening and challenging. Trusting God when fear seems to stand up and look at us right in the face. Trusting God in all times and places. Not only trusting in God that we will have enough, but trusting that God will make us strong enough So the vivid and exciting reception of Jesus that Sunday was a, another moment, another moment to go to his people, this time face to face, this time personally, not through the voice of a prophet, not through signs, but face to face and say, your Savior, sent by God, brings you peace, peace now and peace forever. Peace in all times and all places. Jesus talked about that peace as he lived through the latter days of his own life, earthly life, as he himself was faithful and trusting even in the darkest hour. He comes to announce the banishment of all fears. He tends to plan, come to tell us in our own hearts, fear not, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'll care for you more than you can ever imagine or dream. And his promise was sealed on the cross, in his death, and in his resurrection. Friends, Jesus has come to abolish fear and to let hope abound among his people. All praise to our Lord. Would you pray with me? It does, Lord, seem that every time and every place we turn, a new threat appears, a new fear is engendered. 
who seem to um, lose heart and faith. But on this day especially, as we welcome the Christ, let us also welcome his peace and his promise, his promise to, fear, to not fear and that he will love us, provide for us, strengthen us, and sustain us. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. Come, take your home in our hearts. As we ask that in his holy name, amen. We've been asked to remember in prayer this day a former member, Kevin Keller, who will be having cancer surgery on Tuesday. For John to gain the ability to speak and communicate after his brain surgery this past week. For Lainey as she battles brain cancer. For Nikki, who needs a kidney transplant, for 
for Gail starting new chemotherapy for lung cancer. For Helga, who has ovarian cancer. For Diane McKenzie having knee surgery on Tuesday. Two joys, a grandchild born to Ken Crawford. <laughs> and a happy 50th anniversary to Sherry and Dave Geis. Where are you, Sherry? Oh. <laughs> They're celebrating. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm sure you'll be all, all be uh, remembered to um, tell them that we mentioned them the Sunday <laughs> they weren't here. Okay. Some of you uh, may know in detail what I've been told only in part that uh, today there have been a number of bombings of Christian churches in Egypt and a significant number of deaths and injuries in those bombings. So we want to remember um, all of those who are affected. Let us pray. God, we are buffeted by the real threats that exist in our world. And we who have felt the blunt force of trauma and the sting of death understand the impact that these events have on people. And knowing something about post-traumatic stress, we understand the ongoing effect. So we offer our sincere prayer, O oh God, that as you entered a very tense city at an intense time of the year, so we know you are not um, frightened by the demands of a dangerous world. We give you thanks that you are not one who sits loftily away and detached from the concerns of the world, but one who has taken on our form, walked in our shoes, experienced our pain. So we commend to you all of those who have been affected by the struggles in the Middle East, and especially those who have felt the horrors of violence and warfare. We confess that we are not above our little wars that we have from insults that we have received or lack of attention we feel we deserve. And so there is even within us a trace of a heart for battle. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would transform our hearts and the hearts of all in this world. Especially we pray for the leaders who make day-to-day -day decisions. We pray, Lord, that you would seal upon them a vision of possible peace that inspires them and helps them to be diligent in working for justice that gives peace the possibility throughout the world. We know enough to know that righteousness is not all on one side, that all of us have fallen short of your glory and all of us have some stake in the way the world now is. So we pray that a spirit of humility and faith 
will lead us to a better day. Through the transformation of our hearts and the hearts of the world. There are some who have gathered this day for whom suffering is not just a distant memory, but is a present issue. We know some and have mentioned some by name. We pray for your presence and your power to be upon them. But there are others who struggle for whom each day is a difficult challenge, for whom relief seems almost impossible. <coughs> we ask, O oh God, that we would be the kind of church whose relationships with one another are such that we bring healing and that we live with hope that perhaps not today, or not tomorrow, but at some point within reach, you will bring peace. We trust you for what we cannot do for ourselves. And we give you thanks that you have made your determination known in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. So we offer these prayers in his name and we humbly pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. To our Lord and Savior, we offer praise and thanksgiving. We offer the gifts of our lives, our very hearts. Let us present our morning tithes and offerings.
do praise you and offer you all honor and glory. On this day, we honor and give you glory for the coming of Christ again, through the establishment of his kingdom and to peace. Receive us the gifts that indeed your truth would be told. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Fear has been vanquished, hope has been renewed, trust sustains, and may the power of God, our trust in him, the grace of the Spirit, be with you now until his coming, as the people said, Amen. Amen. 